Welcome back to the Means Report as we continue to examine the incident in Orlando and terrorism in general. And I'm so grateful to have a political scientist from Augusta University. He is an assistant professor at AU. He's Dr. Craig Albert. He knows a lot about this subject and he's been lending his expertise to us in the media of late. And we thank you for your time, Dr. Albert. Absolutely. Thank you. I was trying to figure out, preparing for this broadcast, some way to summarize why ISIS hates us. And the best I could do was because you come into our countries and kill our people and take our oil. Why do they hate us? That's a complicated question. <laughs> it's yeah. a good question to start with. It's much more than, than us occupying any of their lands. ISIS, is, is, in their interpretation, is a very theologically invested organization. So. They want to establish a worldwide caliphate, a worldwide governance under the authority of a caliph. They want to take over the world. Precisely. All parts of the world. Uh, they began with just the idea of being able to take over all parts that had ever been in the hands of Muslim rulers before. And now gradually that's starting to expand into a larger scale. So it's much more than just hatred against the U.S. It's they believe it's their theological right to be the government of the world. That doesn't sound like the kind of group that would ever give up. That's correct. They are not going to give up. They're, if you study their theology, if you, if you invest in a systematic understanding of their theology, there is no giving up for them. Once somebody buys into ISIS, it not only changes their ideological viewpoint, it changes who they are as humans, really. Their nature revolves around this idea of their Islamist Theology. I talked to the ministers about how they might de-radicalize somebody or try to get them to not go down that road. What does ISIS say or do to these people, largely young people, to convince them to join? Well, they go after people. So there's two types of, of ISIS recruiting. There's kind of the self-recruiting, the self-radicalization, and then you have the more firm direct communication recruiting by ISIS. When they recruit themselves, they look at social media postings, they look at individuals, and they try to find three variables. They try to find people that post that they feel alienated or oppressed by their government, by society, by people at work, any type of alienation or, or oppression. Then they look for people with criminal tendencies, uh, because it's much easier to convince people that already have a criminal past to continue a criminal future. And then they look for individuals that are mentally unstable, some type of emotional disturbance. Preferably, they would like to find somebody that has all three of these areas. Uh, this makes for the perfect recruit for them because they know that by once they buy into the ISIS ideology, they're going to be in that for life, and it's going to be very hard for them to get out of it because of these three tendencies. You know, when I think of peace talks or any sort of negotiations to end a war, I think of compromise, I think of middle ground. Is there anywhere we can meet these people or the world can meet these people that would make them say, okay, you know what, maybe we'll back off? No. No, it's just not going to happen. No, ISIS doesn't believe in compromise. The, we have to understand this from their level, and this is what I try to tell uh, other academics, uh, members of Congress. When you deal with ISIS, you're dealing with people that are theologically convinced that they're right, that they're doing the will of God. They believe that if they don't follow through with their interpretation of Islam, that they will not get the rewards of heaven. So if, to compromise in their mind means that they go against what God wants. Have they always been around on some level? They're making a ton of headlines in recent years. ISIS is an offshoot of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So they started as a branch of Al-Qaeda. Now, of course, what's interesting is they broke off because they didn't think Al-Qaeda was ruthless enough. And Al-Qaeda has kind of been in a civil war with ISIS through the Nusra Front in Syria. Mm -hmm. So they're both fighting each other, which is interesting. So we're witnessing an Islamist civil war between these two groups. Doctor, and, go ahead. And Al-Qaeda has, has said to ISIS, back off. This isn't what we are or what we want. So they believe that Al-Qaeda believes that ISIS is too brutal. That's disturbing. Yes. Did we get out of Iraq too soon? I think we absolutely got out of Iraq too soon. There, there's two types of strategies that we have here. We have uh, the strategy to go in and defeat the enemy. We largely accomplished that uh, through most of our missions. We have one of the strongest militaries, if not the strongest military when it comes to strategic engagement. The second part of that is what the United States so often fails at, which is nation building, infrastructure. So it's one thing to go in and destroy the enemy, but it's a generational idea, it's a generational tactic to rebuild a country, to rebuild a government in which they had no understanding before the United States went into Iraq. 
Do you think that incidents like the one in Orlando and the ones, sadly, that are sure to follow can be stopped? And if so, how or, or, or can they not? The lone wolf, the self-radicalization, is much harder to stop than direct communications, uh, uh, direct recruitment from overseas. We can capture them, we can survey them, we can get snapshots of what they're doing. They, sometimes they can be lazy, they don't understand that it's much easier for our intelligence agencies, for the NSA to, to, to grab a screenshot of their messages, if you, if right. you understand. The self-radicalized individual is much harder, living right here in America, is much harder to, to get. It, I would say it's virtually impossible in a liberal democratic republic such as the United States to prevent this from happening because what you would need is a total surveillance system which of course goes against the ideas of freedom and liberty for US citizens. So you can't stop this type of self-radicalization and these types of attacks in the type of government that we have. Okay, so self-radicalized people aside, is there a head of the snake somewhere we can target? We're trying to get after al-Baghdadi and ISIS's self-proclaimed caliph. Uh, other sects of Islam are, are trying to go against ISIS and say this doesn't represent who Muslims are. Other jihadist groups are going against ISIS. To stop ISIS, and we're doing a great job at this recently, pushing them back, lessening their strength and control of territory that they have right now in Iraq and Syria. So we're, we're tightening the noose around their headquarters inside Raqqa, Syria. We're not sure how that's going to play out as far as destroying it, of cutting the head off of the snake. Uh, in their systematic understanding of, of Islam, there can be another election if you meet the certain standards under Sunni Islam to be a, a caliph, the same as Baghdadi was declared. So. It, it remains to be seen if killing him or getting rid of him will do anything. It, it could have two effects. It could show potential recruits that ISIS is on the downfall, let's not join them because it's a dying mission and we don't want to be a part of that. Or it could galvanize support and create even more problems. Uh, people will come out more supportive of ISIS. Does the world have our back on this, this being defeating or battling vigilantly ISIS? Does the world have our back? I'm not sure the entire world has come to grips with how bad ISIS is yet. Do, not, they, do they need to be attacked first? Unfortunately, that's what it seems like. Uh, Europe wasn't that concerned with ISIS. Of course, they had our back and, and allowed uh, certain relationships to be formed to, to fight ISIS, but they obviously were, were, were much more uh, serious about the matter after the Paris attacks, after Brussels, and, and now they fully understand. And, and they should because there are we know of armed cells in both of those countries, in Belgium and France, that are they're small, they're fully operational and ready to go at any moment now. So, Let me get back to recruits, sure. would-be recruits, just for a moment and ask you this. Do you think it might be appealing to a person who's thinking about joining ISIS to realize, and maybe I'm wrong, to realize whatever I do in the name of ISIS, I'm probably, or ISIS probably, is gonna get away with it because there don't seem to be any ISIS ending repercussions yet. You think it's probably an easy path to terrorism because you can probably get away with it? It's not just that you can get away with it, it's the eternal rewards that you'll get for going into something like this. So how Baghdadi, how ISIS, how jihadist camps recruit people is that promise of eternal salvation promise of heaven, promise of paradise, no matter what. So one of the reasons Mateen swore allegiance to ISIS during his 911 calls and on Facebook, for instance, is that Baghdadi has told people, and it's in their publications, it's, it's, it's all over their propaganda materials, that if you are Muslim and commit an act of terror before you die, if you swear allegiance to me, if you swear allegiance to the caliphate, you will reap the rewards of paradise mm -hmm. in that one simple act. Do they care who our president is? ISIS? Yeah. I think they absolutely care who our president is and who the next person we elect will be. Well, they're not nicer to us depending on who's in office, are they? No, it makes their job easier depending on who the next president is going to be. Who do they want to be president? I think that they believe anybody who, who generalizes Islam as a particular type that, that is uh, anti-immigrant, that is definitely the person they're going for. So yeah. in, in this case, I think they certainly would prefer Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton. Let me explain that so the viewers don't get too upset. Right, because it seems like Trump or Trump would tell you he's 
got a harder line on them than Clinton does. And that's precisely what ISIS wants, because a harder line against immigrants coming into the United States, against Muslims coming into the to United States, against the 99.99% .99 of Muslims in the United States that are perfect citizens, that have civic virtue and, and moral virtue, by coming down on them, you open the path for them to become radicalized through ISIS. Got ISIS it. wants that to occur. Probably my last question. Can anything on the gun control front be accomplished that might prevent things like Orlando? Can we keep those types of weapons out of the bad guys' hands? No. I didn't think so. And, and it saddens me, one, that that's the, the, the reality of, of the situation. There are more guns in America than there are people in America. So even if you, you, you had the, the type, if you make gun ownership illegal, the guns are out there. People who want to do bad things are going to get them. Yeah. So in, in Belgium and in France, you can't buy a semi-automatic weapon, period. But we've seen those attacks there occurred with semi-automatic weapons. Bad guys who want to do terrible things are always going to get those types of weapons. Dr. Craig Albert, your information has been incredibly helpful, and I appreciate it very much. Appreciate your expertise. Thank you. Absolutely. Dr. Craig Albert, Assistant Professor of Political Science, Augusta University, and a great resource for our community. I promise you that.